Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, for the last year, I have been looking at the Flat Earth Movement as a conspiracy theory and a social movement. Uh, in my opinion, it is not a cult, it is a mass movement. And I'm very confused as to why people in the 21st century would have the idea that the Earth is flat. Is it a lack of scientific knowledge? Is it a mental illness? Is it a mass movement and a f need to feel like they're part of a group? I really don't have a good answer for you, at least not until today. Let me tell you how I make my videos. I go through my YouTube channels and I have a look and see what's out there. And if I find a video that I think has a good teaching point to it, I'll sit down and I'll review it and I'll have a discussion about it. Well, I was doing that today and I came across a video by a gentleman by the name of Vincent Rhodes. Now, Vincent Rhodes is a creationist and he reviewed a documentary called The World Upside Down. And this is by the Pillars of Truth Christian Church in New York. Now, most of his review in his 34 minute video consisted of him saying, aw shucks and glory hallelujah. So I felt that it was really not very contributory. So I went ahead and I went to the original documentary. And here it is right here. And over the next hour and four minutes, I was captivated. Absolutely captivated. Because I had an epiphany, a thunderbolt of mental clarity and understanding. The Flat Earth Movement is nothing more than warmed over creationism, intelligent design, whatever you want to call it. Every single argument that I have looked at in the flat earth over the last year comes directly from creationism and the Bible. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over this documentary, not as a scientific evaluation because it isn't science, it's nonsense when it comes to science. I'm going to go over it from a sociological standpoint and I'm going to demonstrate that flat earth and young earth creationism are two wings of one bird. So for the next few weeks, next 10 or 12 episodes, we're going to go over this documentary point by point. And I'm going to point out how the arguments of young earth creationism are used directly in the flat earth. And flat earth is nothing other than young earth creationism. So let's cue up the music and get started. We've got a little row to go. We are told that this sphere, while rotating at this speed, is also orbiting the sun at over 66,000 miles per hour. This is the equivalent of traveling from London to Beijing in 5 minutes flat. We are told that our solar system is rotating through the Milky Way galaxy at a speed of 483,000 miles per hour. We are told that our galaxy is traveling through the universe at 1.3 million miles per hour. And yet here we are, still, stationary, motionless. Does this not sound familiar? Is it not the same argument from incredulity that we hear with the flat earth? Of course it is. What does it not take into account? The fact of relative frame of reference. Now, if you are a disinterested third party sitting at a fixed spot in the universe, these numbers all make sense because they're true. However, if you're on the earth, you're revolving on that earth at 1,038 miles an hour, just like the ground is. So your relative motion to the Earth is zero. One of the questions that I've often asked the Flat Earth, and I'll ask the young creationists the same way, they maintain that we should feel this rotation if the Earth was indeed rotating. Okay, in what direction would we feel the rotation? So far, I haven't been able to get a good answer on that. But let's go ahead and continue. Let's see what else he has for us. Maybe we'll find some other familiar ground questions begin to arise. Why is it that we see the same stars in the sky every night? Why is it that we can see distant objects that should have dipped below the horizon? 
Why is it that no matter how high we go, the horizon is always flat? Why is it that we feel nothing? Why is it that every single one of these questions has been answered? Yet still, in January of 2020, you ask the same questions. Are you not listening? So let's look at a couple of them. The skyline of Chicago across Lake Michigan. Given the observation height of the cameraman, and the weather conditions on that day, and the distance, and the height of the buildings, we should have seen them. We should have seen the skyline of Chicago. Surprise, surprise, we did. Do we see it every day? No because it is a meteorological effect. It is a mirage. Now, let's look at the question of the stars. Can we see the North Star from the Northern Hemisphere all year long? Of course we can. It's directly above the North Pole. All we have to do is look north in the sky. Can we see Orion all year long? No. We only see Orion in the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. So once again, what we're dealing with is a narrative. This is a narrative that has to fit in order for their entire worldview to work. And anytime anybody questions it, what they do is they ignore the explanation given. They ignore the evidence that is given. They wait two weeks and they ask the same question again. It's almost maddening. How many times do we have to explain these things before you understand that your entire outlook here is incorrect? I don't think it'll ever happen because the narrative is more important than the data. Let's continue. The truth can be found in one place and one place only, and that is the Bible. Today, we'll be taking a tour through God's holy word to determine if we truly are on a fast-paced ball hurtling through a chaotic universe, or if there is another reality one far more believable. Now, do you notice the use of language that he's using? This is what they are telling us, okay? As opposed to, you, this is what your book is telling us. I guess they and your book are two different things. The other thing is the use of the term believable. When it comes to religion, you're dealing with a matter of faith. When you're coming to science, you're dealing with a matter of data. In the debunking community, there are many people that proudly say that they are atheists. I'm fine with that. That's a choice that they made based on their evaluation of their lives. I have other people in the debunking community and, in, in fact, in science in general that are people of deep faith. I can respect that as well. Again, that is from an assessment of their outlook on life. The difference between a scientist of faith and somebody like this that's trying to promote a narrative is a scientist does not confuse his faith with his data. So in these coming episodes, I'm going to explore this to some depth. I'm going to get a lot of comments, I think. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of preempt a few of them. I am not an atheist. What my faith is and the magnitude of my faith is, quite frankly, none of the concern of YouTube in general. I do respect people of faith. I respect people that don't have faith. I respect people who don't go to church, but live their lives in a good way and treat others with respect. I don't respect people that go to church on the weekend, forget what they heard on Monday, and spend the week living a bad life and treating people with no respect at all, and then asking for forgiveness the next weekend. I can't, I can't respect that. I can't respect people who claim to have strong religious beliefs and be good Christians, for example, that swear at me in chats, that assault my integrity and my morals and me personally because of an idea that I'm putting out. I don't think that's a very Christian way to treat people. And I see the hypocrisy. I don't respect people who try and talk about a idea or a narrative they have, like young earth creationism, and falsify their data. They know enough about radiometric dating 
to understand that a certain test will not give them a valid result. They lie to the lab about the sample that they're submitting, and then they flaunt the fact that they got an erroneous result. Now, that was the Mount St. Helens rock that was put in and, you, and used uh, potassium argon dating with a half-life of 1.3 billion years. So, we're going to go ahead and continue this episode next week. I'm going to start off with chapter one. There's a total of nine chapters. Some of them may require two episodes because they're kind of long. But I think that it is a very exciting and interesting documentary. I've got a link to it in case you can't wait, but the fun part is me talking about it. So make sure you hit that little like and subscribe button down there in the lower right corner. Hit the bell so that you know when the, uh, when the videos come out, and I'll be seeing you again soon. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thanks again for stopping by. Take care.